to have you with us as we start off our number three with the great Lapis, uh, who, of course, has been on top of this since the NCAA tournament. We've got a lot to get to as we get to the Final Four. Steve will be with us one day next week. He's done a wonderful job here this last day of March. Steven, a pleasure. How are you today, pal? Okay? I, I'm doing great, dog. You know, a little, little tired. I had five days in New York in the studio, and I just flew to Indianapolis today. So, But this is it. This is the stretch run. Uh, when you went to Indianapolis today, first off, uh, we should do a second of here on this. Uh, Oregon State, boy, they couldn't wait to get them, get them the hell out of town. You know that they, when they lost the other night to Houston, they put them on a 115 charter back to Corvallis. I mean, my God, can, can they wake up in the morning and, and go? The NCAA, when you lose, you're out of town, Steve. They've run this tournament yeah. pretty precisely. Let me hear. Thoughts? You know, uh, I'm not surprised, especially with what's going on with the COVID and stuff. But that's a little that's a little bit extreme, I have to say. <laughs> that's a little extreme indeed. All right, what is um, uh, I, I are you surprised that Gonzaga's looked this good four games? Uh, you know that that people ask me what were your biggest surprises last night. You know, I was surprised that that Michigan lost, and I was surprised at how good Gonzaga is. And I've seen them a million times this year, and just. They never cease to amaze me. They just, they're just getting better and better. And you know what? You start to think, dog, and a, a lot of people always say, well, they don't play anybody for the last two months. Well, think about the Big Ten. They played a rough conference schedule and no teams left. Maybe the way to go is to play a light schedule in January and February because they look as fresh as could be right now. Yeah, good point, Steve. I think that's where a few gets a tremendous advantage compared to these other coaches. You know, he's lost. I think he's lost 31 conference games in 20-something years. So he can pace his team perfectly. Hard schedule to start the year, challenge them, a cakewalk for 20 games, and then pick it up again in a conference tournament and they're raring to go so they don't get all those bumps and bruises. And I think, uh, you know, from what that, you know, I hate that West Coast Conference. I don't take it seriously. I don't even take their unbeaten streak seriously because of all those games against the Portlands of the world. But as far as being fresh in the tournament, as you say, Maybe that is the way to go for the Zags. Let me hear your take. Go ahead. And, and you know what? And you know what, dog? The other thing about that is it always helps when you know you've got a team that's going to be in the tournament. So you can do things during – in other words, instead of trying – like I was trying to win every game I could to make sure I was going to get in the tournament. When you have yourself a situation where you know you're going to get in, you have a little less pre- – not- there's always pressure. Let me just – I don't want to say there's no pressure. There is pressure on Mark Few. But – you feel a less, little less pressured to make every decision every day come out the right way. I think it helps them some. Uh, uh, they, uh, uh, listen, we'll get to the UCLA. I'll get off them. We'll get to the UCLA game in a minute. Uh, how does Michigan not have a guy to get them a basket in the last five minutes when they won the Big Ten and, and they were so good all year long? And then in the last five minutes, they can't crack 50 points. I know they lost the big kid livers there, but they can't crack 50 points and can't find them anybody to get them a big basket, any one of which could have won the game. How is that possible with the Wolverines? You know, you, you, you just feel like, dog, that at some point not having Isaiah livers was going to hurt them. And with all that, with all that, as you said, they go 0 for their last eight. They needed one basket. I mean, I'll tell you what, I was really surprised in that game at how bad Franz Wagner was the last five minutes. He's a good player, and he was completely lost in the last five minutes. He had a couple of easy shots. The last shot that he had was a pretty good look from three for a guy who makes threes. Um, yeah, but you're right. The, I mean, for them to score 49 points, you know, you know what the funny thing was? Mick Cronin, the coach of UCLA, has been talking a lot about how and, and the truth is, this team wasn't great defensively. This, the Cincinnati teams were always great defensively. This UCLA team was great offensively, but that game last night, that looked like his teams from Cincinnati that were tough, hard-nosed, physical, and really defended unbelievably. Now, you can't call them a Cinderella. They're a UCLA. Are you shocked, however, that they won five games to get to this point? Hey, I, you took the words right out of my mouth. I said it on the air the other night. Somebody said to me, well, you know, UCLA is a Cinderella. I said, how can UCLA ever be a Cinderella? I don't care who. They, they, they just, it's impossible for them to be a Cinderella. But, yes, I was surprised they won. But the way the game went, I'm not surprised that it was a low-scoring game. I really thought it was going to be in the low 60s. I didn't think it was going to be 51-49. But I knew it was going to be a grinded-out game. 
and then it would be a close game. I'm surprised that Michigan, who's been great this year offensively in the half court, great, that they could not get it done in the end when they needed one basket to get over the hump. Was Howard in his first big job as a head coach, was he a little flustered down a stretch designing plays and timeouts and all those kinds of things compared to Cronin, who's been around a long time? Was that a factor? You know, I would say that that would be a factor if they weren't getting good looks. They got pretty good looks down the end. You know what I mean? They, Wagner missed a layup. He had an open three basically at the buzzer. So, you know, the kids missed shots. You know, they weren't like throwing it all over the place and losing the game. Now, maybe uh, Juwan Howard kept going inside a lot when it looked like Hunter Dickens it was really being, you know, uh, he was being mugged in there. You know, they were doubling him, and he was struggling with getting the ball out of the post. Maybe you say, hey, maybe they should have stopped going 100 Dickinson as much. But, you know, I think Juwan Howard did a great job this year, and I, the kids missed some shots that they normally make. All right. Uh, Baylor, didn't like what I saw, Steve, at all late in the second half, well, really the whole second half against the first time I was very unimpressed with them. You know, isolation, Three guards at the top. One guard dribbles for 27 seconds, and they try to formulate a play. It's almost like they were trying to stall against Arkansas there a couple nights ago. Did not like their approach. First cracks for Baylor that I didn't like was in that was in the Elite Eight game. What's your take on their win against the Razorbacks? You know, they, they are a much better team in transition than they are in the half court, and I agree with you. They go one-on-one a lot in the half court. And with them, if their defense isn't creating turnovers, because, I mean, they force like 16 turnovers a game during the year. And even in the tournament, they're forcing over 15 turnovers a game. Um, When they're not forcing turnovers and you make them play in the half court, they can get a little stagnant and they can go a little one-on-one. I think what also hurt them in that game, especially in the first half. Now, in the first half, they were had a nice lead. But uh, Davion Mitchell has been stupendous in this tournament. He gets his third foul. He was plus 16 in the first half, that kid. He is so important to them. So I agree with you. They're not a great half court team. They tend to go one-on-one. But those four guards defensively, when they get out and go, they can really make some plays. And, uh, but, but they're not a great team when they don't turn you over. That's the big problem with them. Yeah, and they're not gonna have, they're gonna have a lot of trouble against Gonzaga. We'll get to that in a second. I, what's your take on a Houston Oregon State game? You know, you gotta give Houston credit. They almost blew a seventeen point lead. They got the game tied at fifty five, and then they played well the last three minutes. But they don't score enough, so they are always gonna keep the opponent in the game, which is a problem too, because they just don't have enough firepower to put teams away, which is interesting against Baylor. What's your take on the Houston game against Oregon State? Well, you know, the crazy thing about that game was, think about how hard it has to be in an Elite Eight game. You shoot 32% and win. If somebody told Kevin Sampson that morning, hey, you know, you're going to shoot 32% tonight, he'd say, well, we're not going to, we shouldn't show up. And they won the game. I mean, so their offensive rebounding is at an elite level. They, had, they took 15 more shots than Oregon State in that game. So, I mean, that's what they do. They wear you out. They're great defensively. Uh, but you're right. They can be a little crazy when it comes to scoring. Now, Quentin Grimes, he's the one consistent guy. He's made four. He's, he's like the first guy in like 30 years to make four threes in four straight games uh, in the NCAA tournament. So this guy can really shoot, and he has shot the ball very well. But the other guys on the team, Giroux is also a terrific point guard. Everybody else can be a little inconsistent. So this team offensively, you never know what you're going to get, but you always know you're going to get great defense, and you're going to get great offensive rebounding. Those kids play really, really hard. And, you know, they're going to give Baylor – I think Baylor will win the game, but they're going to give Baylor some trouble because they're so physical and so tough. Yeah, I like Baylor to win the game too. I'm 100% right. I can uh, Cronin – uh, keep the tempo to his liking to such a degree that he can sort of frustrate Gonzaga and make that game, you know, uh, essentially a toss-up in the last five minutes? Or is he going to be in a situation where he's going to play it the same way, walk the ball up the court, try to get uh, Gonzaga away from creating some turnovers, and try to play it possession by possession? That's how he's going to handle it. Can he be successful to any shape, way, or form here on Saturday against the Zags? Well, put it this way. I'm glad that me and you last week didn't, because it hadn't happened yet, we didn't talk about the possibility of USC playing Gonzaga, because I thought USC was going to keep the game close. 
I thought they were going to play slow. I thought they had a great inside defender that was going to give Timmy trouble, and none of that happened. They didn't even show up last night. Uh, that being said, I mean, I think that Mick Cronin is definitely going to try and control the tempo of this game. USC, I think, was going to try. They couldn't do it. I don't know. Is Gonzaga that good where you can't? Gonzaga plays so fast, and I don't mean just in pushing the ball up the floor. Even when they don't push it up, they pass it fast, they cut fast, they do everything fast. And uh, I don't know if UCLA, the pace of that game, can easily get away from UCLA. But obviously, that's what you have to do. You cannot – the problem with Gonzaga, too, is they've scored 80 every game this year except three. Every game. So, I mean, how do you – you've got to slow them down somehow, some way. But they're better defensively than people give them credit for. They're not going to let you slow it down. They're going to keep the heat on you. And people always talk about the great offense. Yeah, they average 92 a game. They have great offense, there's no doubt. But they're underrated defensively, too. So they don't make it so easy for you to control the tempo. No, good point. They are better than you think from a defensive standpoint. How do you look at this Gonzaga team being unbeaten? I think it's a joke to compare them to Indiana or UCLA or any of those teams, only because 20 of their wins have come so easy in that West Coast Conference. If they're in a Pac-12 every year, they're going to lose a couple games just because a road game, a road trip, and a big spot team gets into it, and they're going to lose a game or two. So I don't take the unbeaten thing that seriously. How about you? They're having a historic great season, but are they an all-time great team? Absolutely not. I mean, put it this way. Let's go back to 1982. Worthy, Jordan, and, uh, and Perkins. What about that team? I don't care if they lost four games or three games. That team was better. The, the problem nowadays, dog, as you know, is that it's, the, the game is a little watered down because you're not playing against – imagine if you're playing against seniors that are all American and lottery picks. Now you're playing against freshmen that are lottery picks. So, yes, they are having a historic, unbelievable, historic season. But if we're going to stack them up with the greatest teams of all time, uh-uh, we're not doing that. Now, 100%. All right, so you like UCLA and Baylor. Could Baylor, since I'm not going to talk to you beforehand, can Baylor be competitive against Gonzaga? When I mean competitive, I mean, you know, within five points with six minutes left. I, yeah, I think so. But, you know, like I said, I thought USC was going to do a lot better last. USC shook me up a little bit, i got to be honest with you. And, uh, but yes, I think Baylor, Gonzaga, that's the game we've been waiting for for two years. You know, they were the two best teams in the country last year, too. So we've been waiting for this game for two years. And I think it's going to be a big-time national championship game, and I think it will be a good game. I think in the end Gonzaga wins, but I think it'll be a good game. All right, uh, who matches up best against Gonzaga in this next uh, match? Is it UCLA, Baylor, or Houston? Who would match up best against them? No question, Baylor, because Baylor's guards are, are they're not as good as Gonzaga, but they're pretty damn good. Uh, they're a little smaller. I think that's what hurts them a little bit more. The Gonzaga guards are really big. But I think the key to playing Gonzaga is you have to have great guard play. You've got to start out by being able to guard those perimeter guys and that's what's going to allow you to control the tempo is if you have good perimeter play from your guards. And these guards from, from Baylor are tough, they're good scorers, and they can put the pressure on Gonzaga. There's no doubt that the best matchup for us to watch in terms of having a close game is Baylor. All right. Would you be more, you'd be more surprised if UCLA won than you would be if Houston won, correct? Oh, yeah. I'd be shocked if UCLA – I'd be shocked if anybody beats Gonzaga. I think this Gonzaga team is uh, – in college basketball today, when you think about it, they got a center that shoots 68% from the field, who, by the way, played against the best defensive center in the country yesterday and destroyed him. Destroyed him, which I didn't expect. That's why I thought yesterday's game was going to be closer. I thought Drew Timmy was going to have some resistance yesterday playing against Evan Mobley, and there, he scored 11 of the first 13 points in the game. I couldn't believe it when I was watching. So uh, that's, the, that's the big thing about them. So they got a great center. They got a four-man, Corey Kispert, who shoots 48% from the three-point line. You got three, six, five guards that all are either point guards or two guards, so they all handle it, they all pass it, they all shoot it. This team is just, the way it's built for today, really, really good. All right, how many pros do they have on that team? Good question. Um, you know, even the kid Timmy, okay, he's a pro. Is he an NBA starter? Probably not. He's not that athletic. I'd say Jalen Suggs. Is, a, is an NBA starter for sure. 
Nemhard and uh, Yayi will play. Uh, Kispert is such a good shooter, he'll play. But they, I think they probably had just one NBA starter on their team, Jalen Suggs, the freshman. Well, only the one. All right, now, uh, uh, let's get to some business here. Let me let you run. Steve Lapis, of course, and he had joined us after the championship uh, game on Tuesday or uh, Wednesday, one of those days next week. Uh, let's do a couple things. I'm assuming that Shaq is smart, saw the hand running on the wall, and that's why he ran to Marquette before they fired him. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think it was a good move, you know, and, uh, you know, take it from me. If you, if you lose a game that the people at your school perceive to be the worst loss in the history of the school, then things get a little tough. And I think that, you know, and, they had, and the, here's the crazy thing. They win the Big 12 tournament, the biggest win probably in Shaka's career. Well, except when he got to the Final Four, obviously, with BCU. But his biggest win in Texas, certainly. And then a week later, they lose to uh, Abilene Christian. So who can figure? So I, I think it was a great move. Shaka is from Marquette, I mean, from Wisconsin. I think it's a great move for him. Um, but you know what they say, nice to stay one step ahead of the posse. All right, indeed. Are they going to hire Beard of uh, Texas Tech? You know, I, he's, he's got it. I mean, that would be a really, uh, I, I don't want to say courageous, but that'd be a tough move to go from Texas Tech where you got this thing going. They, they've made you like the king. They're paying you big, and you're going to go to, of all places, I mean, go anywhere else. But to go to Texas, man, I don't – and I know he went to Texas. I know that. But, wow, that'd be a tough move. I, I, I'm going to say no, but Texas is a better basketball job. There's no question. But look what this guy has done at Texas Tech. I think it would take some real uh, toughness. To leave Texas Tech. To wow, Texas. so you think he owes Texas Tech? He's got to stay there. Interesting. That's the first I've heard I, no, that. I don't, I, think, I don't know. I don't think he owes Texas Tech. I just think that, you know, it, you know he's got to look of all the places to go. I think that would be a tough place to go. All right. Well, who would, uh, if it's not him, who's going to be in line to get that job? I don't know. You know, you think about, I mean, obviously, we had three big jobs open. You know, you had Indiana, Oklahoma, and that job. And, you know, they're going to try and get, you know, guys that are established, that have already, you know, done well. But, you know, guys that are in good jobs, they don't want to leave to start all over somewhere else. So I, I'm really lost on who they could get on that one. I am. Wow. I, Woodson to Indiana, what was your take on that? I think it's a great pick. You know, a lot of people are saying, um, you know, you, you, this guy is in the NBA. You know, but and they and every time you bring up an NBA guy, they they talk about uh, Clyde Drexler or they talk about Chris Mullen or. And, but the thing about Clyde Drexler and Chris Mullen, these guys weren't coaches. They they were great players, or Hall of Fame players, best of all time. Who just decided they wanted a coach. This guy's a coach. This guy's been coaching his whole life. He's a tremendous coach. He needs to get himself a good staff that understands recruiting and like that. But you you give Mike Woodson five guys. He's going to know what to do with it, I guarantee. Yeah, I agree with you. I thought it was a good hire. Uh, I actually yeah. thought it was a good hire. Uh, you know, I know, you know, he got a lot of bad breaks in the NBA. He will make that adjustment, and he's a Hoosier. I thought they made the right call there. Uh, you mentioned Oklahoma. I had Kruger on last week, by the way, and he, we should do a second on him. He's a very unheralded coach. I, I don't think, you know, he doesn't get his due. Kruger is a hell of a co- You know, he coaches the coach. He's a good X's and O's guy. I don't think he cheats. Kruger did a nice job at five places. Steve, give me your thoughts on him first. Let me hear. One of the one of the best guys in this business. If you ask a hundred guys about about any coach in this business, somebody's gonna have something bad to say about him. I guarantee you. You ask a hundred guys about Lon Kruger, nobody can say a bad word about that guy. He is one of the true gentlemen to have ever done this, and he was a he is a heck of a coach. One of the best. No doubt about it. All right, who takes the Oklahoma job? That's not a great job, right? A bad facilities, a football school. Is that a bad job, Oklahoma, or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't call it a bad job because, let's face it, you know, people have had success there. I mean, Kelvin Sampson has success there. Lon has success. I mean, I mean, Lon went to the Final Four there. So I don't think it's a bad job. It's a, I think it's a, you know, it's not the best job in the Big 12, certainly. I think it's a good job. I think it's the kind of job where they're going to get the hot, mid-major guy, whether it's the guy from North Texas, you know what I mean, who they had a great run, who's done a good job, you know, somebody like that, a mid-major guy moving up, I think that's where they end up. 
All right, interesting. I saw Jay Wright's, uh, one of his assistants got the Fordham job. Good luck at Fordham. Uh, that's impossible. But, boy, they go to a lot of Jay Wright's assistants to fill out these staffs. They have Quinnipiac coach and everything else. Like everything else, they go to the guy who's done a hell of a job to get their assistant coaches to make the next step up. Is that correct, Steve? Why not? You know what I mean? If, you, if you're looking for, I mean, you think about it today. You think about the top programs in America. Um, Villanova is a top two or three program in the country, maybe the top program. You think about it. Two championships in the last four years. They get to the Sweet 16 this year, really, with, with you know, their best player getting hurt. I mean, why wouldn't you go to Jay Wright, just like they go to Mike Krzyzewski to get his assistant to, uh, you know, be head coaches? So it's where you need to go because you figure these guys know how to do it. They know how to do it honestly, which obviously is huge, and they build a good culture. So why don't we try it? I, I think it makes a lot of sense for an athletic director to go after a Jay Wright guy, just like it's been for years, to go after a Krzyzewski guy. Fair. All right. Uh, which coach right now is scratching his head really upset that he's not in the Final Four? I, forget Howard. Uh, give me a – is it the uh, Brad Underwood in Illinois? Which coach right now, which how has seen how the tournament unfolded and saw, my goodness, Houston got in, they're beatable. Banner didn't play great in the last game. And UCLA, for crying out loud, which coach is sitting there saying right now, how in the, how in the world am I not if, – if you can't take a coach in the Gonzaga region because they would have lost anyway. But how about the other three regions, which coach is really uh, kind of really second-guessing himself for not being in the Final Four? Yeah, I, I, you brought up the best one, Brad Underwood. There's no question, Illinois. I mean, think about it. They, 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 they would have played Oregon State with a chance to go to, to play Houston to go to the Final Four. I mean, they had, the, they had it laid out really good. They had a great team, you know, but they, how about this? They win the Big Ten championship, they go out in the first round. Texas wins the Big 12 championship, they go out in the first round. I don't know. Maybe there's something to be said for all that stuff. Yeah, 100%. Which coach did you see coaching this tournament that you didn't realize he was this good and you were really impressed by him? Wow, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a really, really good question. Um, let me think. I was going to think you might say the Oregon State coach, but go ahead. Yeah, like, see, I've known Wayne Pinkle for a long time. You know, and that, that is a good one, obviously, because the first time people got a chance to see him in the national spotlight. But, yeah, I, you'd have to say Wayne Pinkle's the guy who made the most uh, headway nationally in the tournament. That You know, let's face it, the, their team was picked 12th in the preseason. They ended up but how about you? But how about you personally? It sounds like you knew that Tinkle was a good coach. How about you personally? I'm going to say uh, – and I, I knew Musselman was a good coach, but I was really impressed with the run by Arkansas. For him to be in his second year and get that program into a Sweet 16 where they hadn't been for a long time, and they've had a lot of really good coaches. Obviously, Mike Anderson was a great coach. Uh, I think he did an unbelievable job, Eric Musselman. I think he's a big-time coach. I mean, he's coached in the NBA. I was really impressed with what he did. Yeah, all right. Uh, give me a coach that, um, I mean, did uh... – Oates do it. You had Oates in that first game. Did Oates do a bad yeah. job of not of not going a little further than a Sweet Sixteen? You know, it, it, they they were sitting there with. I mean, they played a UCLA team, obviously that's really hot. That was able to control the tempo. Yeah, they got to be disappointed. They were probably the closest thing to a one seed of all the twos. So uh, I'm sure Nate Oates. In, but you know, I think that style. I think it's a tough style when you're relying on transition and you're relying on steals and you're relying on transition threes, I think it's a tough style to consistently do when you start playing against good teams because I think a lot of good teams can slow it down on you. A lot of good teams will play half court. And I think the bottom line is, and you take a look, Gonzaga, they could play half court. UCLA, I mean, uh, UCLA, yes, they're a good half court team. Baylor, fair, but still could play it. And Houston, they're probably a really good half. They don't rely on their transition. So I think being able to play some half court is essential in terms of winning a national championship. And, you know, that's not Alabama's thing. So we'll see as the years unfold if they're able to win it playing that style. And last thing on Drew, uh, everybody wants to, you know, hopefully he did it cleanly, but everybody wants to go out there and, you know, what a job he did with the whole mess at Baylor. Uh, is he a miracle man? How about getting him into the, getting this Baylor team into the uh, Final Four 
on the scenario here with where his program was not too long ago. Took the job that I guess nobody wanted and has built it. Let me hear your take on that. Go ahead. It's a, it, it, Really, when you think about what he inherited, I mean, who inherited a situation where one player murdered the, another player? I mean, you know, we're talking about – the worst of the worst in his situation with violations, murders. I mean, it was obviously a tremendous mess. And this guy, and, and, and let's say this, yes, he now is, is in the Final Four for the first time, but he's been to the Elite Eight twice already. It's not like this is his coming out party. This may be his coming out party for people in terms of the Final Four and chance to win it all. But this guy has been a good coach for a long time. He's been there 18 years, and he has done a stupendous job in very difficult circumstances. And the thing about it, dog, is that's not even a great basketball job. You know what I mean? When he went to Baylor, Baylor hasn't been to the Final Four since 1950. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not a place that had a lot of tradition or anything. So they had this mess going on. There wasn't a lot of tradition. You're in a killer league, and look what he's been able to do. Pretty good. Pretty damn good. And by the way, if you were the Baylor women's coach, uh, you'd have a tough time eating your Cheerios the next morning after that non-call I, get, I know Oriama gets calls. How do you not call that a foul in that Baylor UConn women's game, Steve? How about that for a second? Let me hear. That was that was some. You know, you hate to say it. You know, you know, and and coaches always try. We always try to tell our kids, listen, don't get hung up. It's only it never comes down to one play. But if that one play is at the wrong time, that's the killer. And that was a killer. That was a no call there. I mean, it was just terrible. As bad officiating. What else can you say? Uh, speaking of officiating, how scary was it last night with Art Smith? Did you know him? Give me your thoughts on his collapse Kurt there Smith, at the yes. first day. Uh, yes. Kurt, I said, uh, I said, Kurt, I said, Art Smith, Kurt Smith. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, very scary. You know what I mean? And you, you say to yourself, "Geez, I mean, that, that something like that, who someday's going to happen? Where some something bad's going to happen?" And thankfully, it didn't happen last night. Very freaky. Very scary. Steve, great job. Enjoy, Indy. Thanks for so much time today. I'll talk to you one more time next week. Always a pleasure. You Appreciate got it, dog. Thanks. All right, Steve Lapis at half past.